Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all had your break. So now we are again ready for our further sessions. The spirit of the event must go on, right? We're having the amazing keynote session by Professor Claudia Villar Kingshot from University of London, and then the talk sessions on ten wonderful topics. So I request all the passenger of the flight ACCS8 to take their seats and wear their seat belts. We are ready to take off for our next destination. So now. I would like to invite Dr. Asha Vijayan, Assistant Professor, Amrita School of Biotechnology, to chair the second keynote session. Thank you, Mahima. Good morning, Claudia, and good afternoon, all. Welcome back to yet another exciting session. I'm happy to introduce Professor Claudia Gendini Bila Kingshot, who is a professor of magnetic resonance physics at UCL Institute of Neurology and a fellow of the International Society for Magnetic Resonance in Medicine for, for her works on developing MRI methods to understand structure and functions of the brain and spinal cord. She has an international reputation for quantitative, uh, quantitative MR physics applications in neurology. Graduated in solid state physics, she moved to UK for her PhD from uh, University, University of Surrey, she then joined the Institute of Neurology where she uh, based her academic career. Learning to balance well family and work life, she strived to establish her track record, developing national and international collaborations to promote new Im uh, imaging methods and their translation into clinics. Claudia believes that MRI uh, cannot unleash its true potential unless we cross bridges towards other biophysical disciplines an aspect of research that she is actively pursuing. Apart from this, Professor Claudia has been associated with Amrita and have visited the campus during our previous conferences. So without any further delay, I request Claudia to share her thoughts and findings with us. Okay, thank you very much, Asha, for this uh, introduction. And uh, thank you very much, Shiham and Shyam and uh, the entire Amrita University for hosting this conference and for inviting me. Um, I was discussing with colleagues, not last week when I was in Pavia, actually in Italy, um, the time when we came in person to, to Amrita. And I truly hope that one day we will be able to do this again, quite soon, actually. So if I share my slides. So here we go. So I will try to talk through some principle of uh, quantitative magnetic resonance imaging and the relevance to clinical application or may, or I should say neuro application. So I will go through some uh, um, neuroimaging. What, it, what can we do with neuroimaging using MRI? And then uh, uh, touch on the state of the art of two uh, important uh, um, applications of MRI, which are functional MRI and microstructural MRI. And also, I want to give you an idea of the fact that we can go beyond the microstructure and the function and touch on physiology as well. There are some challenges linked to MRI and that are still facing um, the research community, but um, I hope at the end that you will all be inspired and maybe some of you will pursue uh, these challenges in the future and leave you with some uh, new frontiers and limits of MRI. So MRI is taking advantage of the fact that we, our body is made 60% of water and water has got this spin and this associated property by which the water behaves and reacts to external magnetic fields that are uh, uh, present um, around us. So we can try to um, exploit this property of, of the proton that is in the water um, for gaining an insight on the tissue properties, in particular uh, for this uh, talk, I will focus on the brain. So an MRI scanner, I'm, I'm sure that most of you are aware of how, are they, uh, how they look like, and this is a photograph of our uh, scanner through the window, that's the, the reflection. Um, so you have a static magnetic field, which is what is the main uh, bore of the scanner. Then you have some radio frequency coils. The coils are the antenna, basically, that you, you can uh, use uh, for uh, receiving the gradients. And here we can see one on the side of the scanner. 
And this one is for the head. And this thing here, I don't know if you can see it, but it's a part that covers the neck so that you can have the full brain and, and uh, the top of the spinal cord covered in the same acquisition, for example. And then we have these magnetic field gradients, which are um, part of the scanner and allow us to uh, make the, the acquisition or the, uh, the sensitive to position, sensitive to diffusion, and, uh, and are um, part of what we can turn on and off to achieve what we want. So once we have an MRI scanner, what are we going to do with it? So what we are seeing with an image is the reflection of properties that are at the microstructure level. So properties of axon, dendrite, soma, physiology um, that happens in the tissue that at a macroscopic level build up together to react in a certain way and give a certain signal inside the magnetic field of the scanner. So here you can see three pictures of the brain, um, which are beautifully depicting the, the structure of the white matter, which is the axons um, um, part of the of the our neuronal system, and then the gray matter, which is actually the the, the part of the soma and the dendrites, um, and the, where the synapses and where the communication between different uh, neuronal populations happen. So we can we can see these properties at a at a macroscopic uh, level though, because we see properties that are averaged, and I will go through these over and over again um, across like millimeter square or millimeter cube uh, dimensions. So um, as well as seeing beautifully the brain, what we can do as well, we can be sensitive to actually how the brain functions, which is absolutely essential to understand how the brain works and to understand cognition and to understand pathologies. So in this um, screenshot of a, of, a, um, of a figure from this uh, uh, paper, um, they showed uh, the effect of uh, um, stroke and of, of different therapies on stroke patients that had middle artery middle cerebral artery uh, strokes. So these people had all the stroke on the same side. So these green and blue areas is where the stroke happened with the red area is the overlap between, um, I think, eight patients uh, of the stroke uh, of the stroke areas. And then the red parts are the areas um, where longitudinally um, the brain gray matter um, volume increased. So where the therapy uh, produced a, an increased uh, um, an, a, a, a growth of gray matter, which one could associate with some, some, re, um, some attempt to uh, recover from the stroke. So here, um, these patients were underwent just as typical um, rehabilitation plans these uh, patients uh, instead had a typical rehabilitation plan plus um, reading of a book um, regularly, while these patients had a standard uh, rehabilitation plus listening to music, something powerful uh, that could, uh, um, let's say, stir some emotions. And as you can see, the one that had the music seemed to have uh, a better reaction and a better um, um, rehabilitation response than, than the others. And certainly the book or the music on top of the standard uh, physio physiotherapy um, achieved a, a, a better outcome. Similarly, on these patients who had the stroke on the other side of the brain. So with MRI, not only we can look at images and we can look at, at the structure of the brain, but we can also measure how this structure and the microstructure that is supporting the pictures that we see changes uh, over time and with intervention. So, um, so that's why I talk about quantitative MRI because the MRI is not just pretty pictures, it's not just visual assessment. We can measure things like we measure blood samples, uh, uh, blood counts on blood samples, we can measure properties on MRI, which is not necessarily 
go to, to the clinic and to the everyday use in the person management uh, of uh, um, you know of different conditions. So imagine that you've got a neurological, a psychological problem, and you don't know what to do. So the first port of call is to go to your neurologist, to a surgeon, to a psychologist, depending on your issue. And they, they, they have the knowledge to assess your clinical um, situation, your uh, uh, presentation of symptoms, your presentation of the problem, and have a good idea of what uh, they need to do to what probably is going on. So they, they make an hypothesis of what is happening. So for example, they could think that maybe you've got uh, multiple sclerosis or you've got a demyelinating um, um, disease that they can then confirm by visually requesting a radiological report on MRI scans and the radiologist would say, yes, this patient has multiple sclerosis because there's, there are uh, the, the lesions in the places where we expect for multiple sclerosis. Or somebody may expect uh, a dementia. I mean, this patient has a very, very atrophic brain, uh, which is obviously consistent with severe dementia. But you could see some enlargement of maybe the ventricles, which are these areas inside the brain, or um, maybe an hippocamp the hippocampus are shrunk. And you can... And this, normally the, the radiologist is reporting on the fact that the hippocampus have uh, um, show some atrophy or so, some sclerosis and, and that maybe that is indicative of, um, of Alzheimer. In case of spinal cord, you can as well report, uh, um, you know, how the spinal cord look. Of course, by looking at it, this spinal cord is much worse than this spinal cord. And yet in spinal cord, Sometimes patients with that present with this kind of um, damage, maybe due to an accident, are better doing better in terms of their function, in terms of their function than patients that seem to have a continuous core. But you see, these lesions is really extended, uh, extending across the core. So knowing, um, seeing the lesion is not enough to con connect the presentation of a lesion of a malformation with the neurological outcome. So what we need is the quantification of brain structure and function and physiology so that we can maybe predict how bad or how well a patient is going to do. So um, MRI um, was let's say discovered or was proposed as a diagnostic um, imaging method or a diagnostic method in 71, it was not an imaging method yet, uh, by uh, Damadian, uh, Raymond Damadian, who discovered that on a piece of tissue extracted from a tumor, if you looked at, um, under the x-ray machine, you would have similar pictures from the tumor and from the adjacent tissue because their density was similar. While if you put the same piece of tissue in the NMR scanner, so a scanner that doesn't give you an image, but gives you the, the, what we are using for MRI, so the signal from the, the nuclear magnetic resonance signal, he saw that actually the way the signal decays, the changes in the signal from the tissue that has the tumor and the tissue inside that is healthy was very different. And this is because the water in the tissue was surrounded by a different microstructural environment. So the microstructure of the tissue change, can change the properties of the MRI or the NMR properties of the tissue. So given two pieces of tissue of equal density, one a tumor, one a healthy tissue, NMR signal could differentiate between the two. And this was then translated into imaging and we had, there were um, four um, Nobel Prizes, one after the other within three, four years of each other. Um, we managed, to, they managed to invent ways of making a signal or recording this nuclear magnetic resonance signal from different parts of the brain and being able to say where the signal comes from. And you can see these two uh, images are much more modern. This is a CT scan, so based on X-ray, and this is an MRI scan. 
And you can see how here the tumor is much easier to be uh, identified than on this uh, X-ray and the extent of it. And that's why MRI is so powerful because given to two tissues that have similar densities, you can differentiate them by their um, nuclear, their MRI properties, their magnetic resonance properties, as well as, of course, density. If you've got more protons, you've got a bigger signal. So uh, it's not the density doesn't count. So as well as the amount of water molecules in tissue, what uh, is great is that we can take advantage of relaxation processes. So how the signal is formed and decays goes back to um, equilibrium. So we always start an, a, an experiment with an excitation. So we put the system in an excited state and then go and read how the system goes back to, to its normal equilibrium. And then we can also play with these properties and we can try to introduce the concept of weighting. It's a little bit like in photography, you could think, I want to see only the red, um, the red colors in a picture. So you can filter your images and just expose the, the, the component of your picture that you want to look at. And with MRI, we do something similar that looks at different properties of the tissue, whether they are physiological properties, whether they are like microstructural proper properties or functional properties. And to, so we can pro produce images with different contrasts. And the best bit is that we can measure changes in these properties. So we can quantify properties and we can change the proper, we can calculate the properties and look at how they change with pathology, they change with intervention, they change with aging, and so on and so forth. MRI is safe because it is in the radio frequency spectrum. So we are here. So we are at the, at the, at the beginning of the spectrum where there, is, there are no um, interactions that can damage the structure or the microstructure at cellular level. So every effect, the effects of being placed in a magnetic field are reversing immediately as soon as you get out of the magnetic field. So, uh, you know, now it's been since the 70s or the 80s when the first MRI scanners were given, were uh, given to, scan, to hospitals and uh, started to be used clinically. Millions of billions of people have been scanned and there are no con consequences of this scanning. Actually, the, the safety of the MRI scanner is more due to um, behavior of the staff. So, you know, the, 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 the risks associated with MRI are, I don't know, the, the, the nurse that keeps the, the scissors in their pocket and then they bend over to put the person in the scanner and the scissors because their metal are attracted to the magnetic field and are hurting the patients. Or we had people, there are, if you look on MRI safety videos or pictures online, you can find pictures of uh, wheelchairs stuck to magnetics, uh, uh, to the magnet of MRI scanners with the person in between the, the wheelchair and the magnet because a metal, mag and metal chair, a wheelchair has been um, taken into the scanner or too close to the magnet. So, so these are human errors. There's no safety risk from the MRI itself, unless um, um, somebody uses the scanner, pushes it too much and causes uh, maybe burning. But normally it is like for tattoos that include some metal in the, in the, in the coloring. And therefore, when you go in the scanner, the, the metal heats up and burns the skin. But that is, again, human error because that person maybe shouldn't have gone into the scanner. So um, the other thing is that when we measure these properties with MRI, we measure at voxel level. So if we are thinking that um, we have microstructures and cells um, at micrometer uh, dimensions when we are looking at one millimeter cube or even two millimeter uh, per dimension, so eight millimeter cube voxels, so the unity of our images, we have a minimum of 50,000 cells, eight neuronal cells in that voxel. So we are measuring average properties, but it is fascinating how these properties, the cellular properties, are influencing our signal. 
So we want to understand brain structure and function. We want to do quantitative multimodal imaging. So looking at different properties at the same time. And we can look at different also nuclei. So we can also look not only at the proton, but also at other nuclei that have similar properties, like for example, sodium. So we can look at many different properties. Each one of these images looks at a different property of the brain. So this one, for example, is, is uh, the macromolecular total volume, which is linked to myelin. For example, this one is the neuron neurite density, which is linked to the density of the neurons of the axons or the neurites. Um, we've got the G ratio, which is the uh, ratio between the inner and the outer diameter of the axons. So we've got also here, we've got a connectivity um, a map, a streamlined connectivity map. So where we have rebuilt the how different areas are connected between each other. And here we've got the signal, a resting state signal, so a functional signal of the brain from two different areas overlapping each other. So we are looking into this a bit more. We can look at also metabolites with, uh, with uh, uh, MRI, MR spectroscopy. And so we can, and we can also, for example, look at the phosphorus itself, but for these, we normally need a higher, a very strong magnetic field scanner because, uh, because of the very small amount of phosphorus that there is, um, of phosphocreatine uh, that there is in the, in the brain compared to proton. So let's look at uh, brain microstructure dif with diffusion MRI to give you an example, and then the bold signal, the blood oxygenation level dependent um, contrast for function, and then I'll just touch base on the physiology. So we said that we are measuring things at voxel scale. Imagine an axon and imagine water travels along the axon fairly free freely or takes a bit longer to cross the barrier and go in and out, and out of the axons um, uh, perpendicularly to the structure. So this means that our diffusion, the diffusion coefficient of the water is dependent on how the orientation of the axon is compared to the diffusion direction that we are measuring. And we can make the, the, the signal sensitive to this diffusion of water. I'm not going to go in detail on how we do that because it would take an hour just to do that uh, as a minimum. But what you need to take home is that if you don't know how to do it, because maybe you work already in this field, but you can make the MRI scan sensitive to the diffusion of the water in a certain direction. So by acquiring data and, and sensitizing our acquisition to different direction, we can build then what is called the diffusion tensor. So it's a representation of the diffusion of the water in the tissue that we can associate with either a sphere when we have low anisotropy means when the water is happily moving in any direction or with a very, very uh, elongated um, rugby ball um, or um, squashed shape when the diffusion is predominantly in one direction. Imagine the corpus callosum has all the fibers very, very highly parallel to each other. So in that way, we would have a very highly anisotropic um, representation of diffusion, while, for example, inside the ventricles, we may have the sphere. And from these ellipsoids, we can calculate what various parameters, which uh, are independent on how you acquire the data and are representing the microstructure of the tissue. One of them is the fractional anisotropy that you can see here that shows how tightly aligned are the fibers in different areas of the brain. We can't, we, this FA parameter is the parameter that goes from zero to one and is reproducible, is the same. You know, we all have a fractional anisotropy in the corpus callosum of 0 0.6, 0 0.7. And also we can associate uh, a color to it depending on the direction of this el ellipsoid because these ellipsoids are oriented in space following the main direction of diffusion. And for example, we have red when the ellipsoid points left, uh, right, left, green when it is anterior posterior, you see here the optic radiation and blue, the cortical spinal tract when you go superior, inferior. And these are conventions that allow you to check maps and to compare maps between centers and between people. And then you can go and quantitatively measure FA and I can compare FA between 
different people. Of course, this method, the diffusion tensor imaging, has limitations because it assumes or it can be sensitive to a one direction, one main direction of diffusivity. And sometimes if you've got crossing fibers, if you've got complex microstructures, it's a bit redu reduced to um, you know, this very simple representation, but yet it's very simple to understand as well. And clinically it's been used in many, many different research studies to demonstrate um, sensitivity of microstructure changes to different pathologies. So because of this uh, lack of sensitivity to complex microstructure, there have been a pool of mathematical and computational models that have been proposed to try to capture instead the, the microstructure the real microstructure uh, characteristics. So, you know, for example, diffusion has been modeled as sticks uh, and, uh, and with a certain distribution of, uh, of, the, of the possible direct direction of the diffusivity. Um, different, uh, uh, the extracellular water, for example, has been um, associated either to ball or zeppelin or tensors to different um, characteristics. And then some other, compartments or parameters have been associated to what you can't explain, basically. And if you look at uh, these two papers from, they are already uh, 10 years old, but um, Laura Panagiataki and uh, Uran Ferisi did this taxotomy of all possible measures and try to fit real data, really rich real data, and try to understand uh, what is fitting microstructure better. One of the, one of the model, the more complex model that has really taken uh, um, advantage, that's really been adopted a lot in many studies is the neurite orientation, dispersion and density imaging, where you've got um, three compartments. One is the CSF, one is the axon and dendrites, and one is the cellular, the intracellular um, uh, signal that has, uh, that is uh, not a stick though. And these can, can reconstruct many different uh, properties of the brain, including the neurite density, for example, that I showed you in the previous image. And also there are more complicated um, models, this charm, this composite hindered and restricted model, uh, models water movement outside uh, the axons uh, as a hinder compartment. So a compartment where there is some struggling movement, but the water can move away from the starting point forever. And a restricted one instead where they, there is a more confined space where the water can move. And this is a very, very powerful um, um, model because it's, it, it's very much linked to the axon diameter of the fibers. And has been shown that it's very, very sen sensitive to uh, this, this fraction of the intracellular space is very sensitive to pathological changes, but it takes ages to acquire. You need really powerful machines, and it's definitely not something that can be used every day. And how can we use this diffusion microstructure? So I thought of waking up a bit at the mid midway of my talk. So this is my dad playing. I, I always get emotional when I see him playing um, and um, um, he asked me a while ago um, what is the absolute pitch here because he has an absolute pitch here and he he's never been able to explain what's happening so I did a bit of a search and what happens is that basically the you people have looked at associative fibers um, and have looked at the thickness of the cortex, specifically um, of, of absolute pitch here uh, people. And it appears that the superior temporal gyros has a thicker uh, cortex and that the number of fibers that are linking these temporal gyros to other structures um, and that uh, are much, um, have a higher density than in non-absolute um, pitch uh, uh, ear people. So 
it almost as if the when you have an absolute pitch, you, you are able to retrieve information that you've stored somewhere in your brain much faster than um, than other people because you've got a, a bigger road and bigger num- a number, a higher number of fibers that are retrieving the information. So using these these techniques, you could you could try to find out to understand what happens and how to explain certain cognitive uh, um, maybe knowledge that we have about, uh, uh, you know, about, for example, music players. So this was from the structure and microstructure. So what happens instead from the brain function? Can we measure brain function? Yes, we can measure brain function. Why? Because hemoglobin and magnetism are giving us a very powerful tool. So hemoglobin has um, iron, an iron uh, atom inside it, which is well, um, uh, which responds to an external magnetic field. So when you have an oxygen, oxygen in the uh, hemoglobin, so you've got oxyhemoglobin, the oxygen pulls the iron uh, inside the, the molecules and makes it and screens it basically from the external magnetic field. So the Oxymoglobin is paramagnetic, so its magnetic properties are similar to the surrounding tissue. When the oxygen has been consumed, then the iron drops a little bit out of the of the structure of the of the hemoglobin, and therefore is sensitive to whatever magnetic field um, you apply to uh, the brain. And this changes during function. So when the the neurons um, start uh, uh, firing the metabolism of the oxygen metabolism increases. So the initial condition is that we've got more deoxyhemoglobin and then is followed by an increase in blood flow. The brain is actually throwing more blood to the, to the, to the tissue to supply oxygen. And therefore, in the end, there is a, an, ex, in, an increase in oxyhemoglobin. So there is an increase of, paramagnet, of diamagnetic uh, uh, hemoglobin, which actually makes the tissue more uniform. And this changes the properties of the MRI signal that we measure. So when we measure, when we've got neuronal activity, our bold signal is here. There is the whole metabolism, blood flow, blood volume changing and balance that is happening in the middle of it. And yet, even being so far from neuronal activity, many different, um, many pathological alteration are affecting how this response happens. And how do we measure? This is the simplest, the canonical fMRI experiment we've got in initial 20 seconds. We repeat the acquisition of lots and lots of very fast images, images acquired every, you know, in 100 milliseconds. We've got 20 seconds of rest and then 20 seconds of, for example, a task, and this is squeeze hands, followed by 20 seconds of rest, again, another, task and then a rest. And then we acquire the images and we acquire lots of data, so 100 volumes, and we can fit the data. And the data for each voxel can follow if the the neurons in that particular position of the brain have contributed to the function, their signal will change with the function. Okay, so we've got a stimulus pattern and we've got uh, a brain and a brain that has been acquired many, many times. And if we go and look at a certain voxel, we can go and have a look whether the signal in this voxel matches the pattern of our task. And in that way, we can find what is um, what part of the brain has ta- have taken place or have taken uh, part in a certain task. So if I find if I do this analysis and I find these areas, I can see that probably this was a visual motor task because we've got the, the, the visual cortex and the motor cortex and premotor cortex and associative cortex is all um, responding and being in sync with our task. There is another way of doing um, fMRI with event-related design. So instead of having a task for 20 seconds, we have very short task followed by a waiting a rest period, much longer rest period. And this allows us to, um, to track a bit more what happens to the signal after each excitation. 
say, for example, we, uh, we deliver a stimulus for three seconds and we wait in to, for 20 seconds before giving another stimulus, but we continue acquiring the data like before. So in this case, what would happen is that if this is our response, if this is the uh, response of the blood response, but blood increases, increase, increase of flow and then uh, decrease of uh, oxymoglobin again, and we keep acquiring the data, what we can see is that we can acquire data. And as we are not repeating the task, we can probably map a bit more the um, hemodynamic response function. And then there is the resting state. The resting state is when the brain is not doing anything. So it, the, the subject is not performing a task. Actually, this came, you know, when this was proposed, everybody was a bit, I mean, I was very, very skeptical. But then with the years, uh, this has been reproduced over and over again. There is a basal activity that is coherent between regions that then are actually participating in similar tasks that are actually getting active together when you do a certain task. So when you look at the brain at rest, although the, this basal activity is at much lower frequency and is, is connected to the fluctuation of, brain acti of spontaneous brain activity that keeps the brain in a resting state, but ready to respond. And the way to calculate it is by looking at different voxels and go and find the patterns that are actually highly correlated between them. And for example, this shows the high correlation between the middle pre prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate cortex. And if you do this analysis, you will see that there are between uh, 12 and 15 so-called resting state networks, which are always found in at especially at group level at subject level it's a bit more noisy but at group level there are all these um these resting state networks that are very highly reproducible between subjects and summarize the properties um again we can measure this functional connectivity between voxels and have a quantitative way of assessing how these networks are there ready to support the brain or to support the brain function. And again, we can use these to look, for example, at this, um, at the conscious state or an unresponsive or responsive um, subject in unconscious state. And for example, again, looking at a resting state network, which in general are attenuated in unconscious uh, subjects, um, this study showed that actually if you play music again to these people, these people are able, or some of the people are responding with an increased uh, functional connectivity in key, very key supporting network. For example, the default mode network, which is a network that is, is there to support uh, brain function. Actually, when the brain works, this ne network loses coherence. And, and actually the patients or that, had a better response to these uh, auditory stimuli, stimuli um, were the one that actually then were uh, able to wake up and, and, uh, and recover a bit. So the last thing I want to show you is the physiology. How can we use MRI to look at physiology? Um, so the membrane, the, the, the sodium uh, ion are essential for uh, conductivity, for transfer of information between regions for and along axons. So I, uh, sodium ions are distributed between the intra and extracellular space and maintain the action potential between the membrane, the axon membrane. And so it is vital that this um, uh, difference in, in ion concentration is maintained and, and works properly for a, a axons to behave in the right way and to be able to respond to function in the right way. So the sodium is an ion that has, um, has a magnetic property. So like the water, like the proton, responds to magnetic uh, fields. So if you've got this, the same magnet that, that we use for proton, you can use it for sodium too. But because it's the sodium is, has a different magnetic characteristic, um, 
you need a coil or a, a receiver and transmit and a receiver uh, coil at a different frequency. So it's like listening to two different radio stations. One is for the proton and another radio station is for the sodium. So when you tune your radio onto the radio for the sodium, you are not listening to the proton. So there is no mix up, mix up between the signals because they are such a, they are in the radio frequency range, but they are a part of, uh, of a few tens of uh, megahertz. So you can tune onto one or you can tune onto the other. So with the same magnet, you need something to pick up the signal from the sodium. So you need an, an appropriate coil. And then to quantify how much sodium there is, what people do is using the uh, uh, reference phantom. So some reference tubes with known concentration of sodium. So you could put saline, you could put um, other concentration of, uh, of sodium. So we did this uh, uh, reference phantom with 33 and 66 millimolar. And then with some maths, simple maths, you can refer the, the, the concentration of these phantoms to the concentration of the sodium in the tissue. Here we are talking about total sodium concentration. Now to go and measure the internet extracellular sodium separately is a very, very tricky. It's one of the challenges that somebody uh, maybe even in this audience could, um, uh, could resolve in future. But the sodium is very sensitive to pathology. This is a healthy brain. And you can, the previous one, this was, was actually a proton image of the sodium and the brain, of the sodium phantoms and the brain. The sodium phantom have got water in them as well. And then when you go and do the sodium, because of the very much lower concentration of sodium compared to water, it's about 10,000 times less sodium ion than water. The signal is a bit, is much lower, so we need to have uh, bigger, chunkier images. But yet, this is very sensitive to uh, pathology. And here you can see in this multiple sclerosis subject how much more uh, brighter the brain is because the sodium concentration is higher in general. So there is a disruption of the sodium homeostasis and the viability of the cells. And this has been shown in ischemia and Alzheimer's and multiple sclerosis and in Huntington disease. And this is very important. The problem is that there are a handful of, of labs in the entire world doing this. Then there is some sort of, um, um, it's important how you do image processing because this is our image of uh, the proton, which is nicely acquired the one by one by one millimeter cube, but we acquire sodium at three by three by three millimeter cube. So we need to take uh, the proton images put them in the resolution of the sodium. And then when we extract the cortical rim from the high resolution, nice um, proton scan, we need to scale it and apply it to the, to the sodium to extract uh, the values. So we need to be really careful in all these processing steps to make sure that what we get is significant and is accurate. And here we've done a study in healthy subjects and I want to point out that, for example, here we found that we divided the subject in left and right-handed because we saw that there was a little bit of a distribution of, of the sodium concentration. And if you look at the uh, left and the right motor cortex, sensory motor cortex, the left-handed and the right-handed have concentrations that are swapped. So now we haven't yet explained this, but there is a change in the, in the overall sodium concentration in the uh, sensory motor cortex, depending on your dexterity. And this could be because of a different cell density or a different, and, and therefore a, a different amount of cells that are helping or are contributing to the fact that you are left-handed and right-handed. And this is something that we need to um, get more information on. So challenges, um, obviously this, to the left is what we are acquiring. So we are acquiring functional imaging data, for example, at three by three by three millimeter cube resolution. We are acquiring sodium information at this resolution. And what we would really like to have is much, something that is much smaller. Even, even this 0.2 millimeter cube has average properties of neurons, but it's something that we would really like to have. The problem is that these, these images here are required with the standard 
cl good clinical scanner, these ones are required at seven Tesla. So there are only, a, a, I think there are about 87 Tesla worldwide, but not everybody does fMRI at high resolution. These took two minutes, these took 24 minutes. And if I want this resolution acquired at these field strengths, because with field strengths, you increase the signal, the signal is proportional to your field strength, you would have to do something like acquiring, believe me, 18,000 times longer this scan, which is totally unfeasible. So there are localization issues with functional MRI. And yet, when we are looking at the resting state and these properties, we still have, we have important information that can help us understanding disease. So in this paper, we looked at the, at the resting state network in Alzheimer's disease patients, in mild cognitive impairment patients, so the prodromic phase of Alzheimer's, and in healthy controls. And the blue is where the resting state network functional connectivity is decreased res with respect to the healthy controls, which is what people had reported by the time we did this work, so that you know, the, the brain had a reduced functional connectivity. But then we looked as also at areas where the, the on, at, how, at whether the network had an increased functional connectivity compared to the healthy subject. And this is what we showed here in red, which was stunning and amazing because you see how much more the connectivity of brain areas at rest is increased in pathology, even in MCI compared to healthy controls. And therefore it's, it's, there is the, these things, is this compensation, attempt to compensation for the loss of, for example, neural, neural density, which is what happens in Alzheimer's disease, or is this something that is not good? So there are more and more evidence now that actually this increase in functional connectivity is actually an, an inability for of the brain to um, adapt and to use different frequencies and to and to therefore be able to swap connectivity depending on the task. And this high and this very high functional connectivity is actually negative in terms of being able to function. And in particular, we, were, we noticed that the cerebellum had instead an increased functional connectivity in, a, in the prodromic phase of dementia and no connectivity, no positive connectivity in the, in the Alzheimer were actually lost some internal connectivity. And this was something that was quite interesting because it was the only network um, um, as well as the ventral network, the lateral ventral network that had this kind of behavior via the swap between increase and decrease functional connectivity at different stages. Um, obviously, we need to generalize our measures. How can we make sure that the same quantitative measure measured in one center and in another are comparable? So there, there are initiatives that try to um, harmonize or to propose how to acquire the data so that they can be used in multi-center studies. And in particular, in Italy, we have put together around 24 or 23 um, hospitals to, to do this work, to propose uh, some acquisition methods for diffusion and for uh, function to be able to acquire data and pull it together to have big data. New frontiers, there are the high field scanners. I showed you how the 7 Tesla scanner can achieve really laminar fMRI signal uh, detection, but also it can achieve sub-millimeter microstructure data that is fantastic in depicting, um, in depicting the brain. So there is a lot going on trying to see whether these can help certain, for example, um, diseases where you, epilepsy that were, where the three Tesla scanner shows that there is no change in the brain, but maybe can we find the focal epileptic zone if we look at seven Tesla. And then there is also this, this thing of impo the importance of going beyond what it is the on off, what it is the, the standard way of doing, looking at brain function. For example, in this experiment, we use a squeeze ball, and we asked the subject to squeeze at different strengths. And we told the subject with a bar um, 
they were looking at the bar, um, how high they had to squeeze. And believe it or not, if you, if you do this and if you ask people to look at this video and to score every trial uh, for strength, this is how our perception of the strength is pretty good. Um, so our system, our mirror system, if we want to refer to it, is able to recognize this kind of how others use, use strength, even from something very simple that if you ask, you know, can you recognize how strong this is, 20%, 30%, 50% of maximum grip force? You would say no, but overall, over time, after all the repetition, without any hint, people could recognize the strengths with an R of 98. And if you look at the signal, at the bold signal, and put it in relation to grip force, for example, in the uh, Brodmann era force, so the motor uh, cortex, you see that in these patients with MS, this is the EDSS is the score of disability multiple sclerosis. These patients with 1.5 are basically healthy. While these patients with EDSS 6.5, so patients that have real difficulty, walks with sticks, can't go far, far at all, have a very different response to how they have how they can perform this task. So so there is a change in how our hemodynamic, how, how the hemodynamic of the system works in pathologies. And if we continue to look at on and off, we don't capture these kind of things. And this could be due to the hemodynamic, but so the, the, the blood flow or the perfusion side of the system, but it could also be a response to an ab abnormal neural system. And how do we explain this? We can't explain it just with MRI. So we need to try to bridge the gap between this large scale system and the cellular level and the modeling of actually how the brain, the neurons work, and then introducing this modeling, the pathologies. And for example, the virtual brain, you will hear from uh, Egidio D'Angelo tomorrow a bit of, about this, I guess. Um, it's a platform that allows to try to bridge the gap and interpret large scale data, mesoscopic modeling with microscopic modeling. And the other thing is that with all of this data that you can generate with MRI, and now the scanner are faster and, and more optimized. So, you know, in half an hour, you can end up with really a lot of, of data. What you can do is to use data mining um, strategies to try to understand whether a disease is Alzheimer's disease, a single disease. Are there facets of this disease that could then be used and can be understood for interventions that are patient specific? Because this is what we want. We want to have patient specific or subject specific intervention because each subject have, have their own way of responding. And this article is very simple was published in 2007 and demonstrated how patients with hearing problems um, who had a good functional response to uh, sound stimuli before cochlear implant had a very good outcome from the surgical intervention, while patients that had no uh, much functional response before uh, the intervention even with the cochlear implant, still couldn't hear. So this shows how MRI and functional, a very simple task, functional MRI experiment can help you go to the patients, the individual patients, and say, if you have an implant, you have a very high possibility of success because you still have some res neuronal response to sound, even if, even if you don't know it. But if you then go and do it with the, with patients that don't have a response, you say you can, um, can operate on you, but you have a likely, a very low chance of success. So, so patients can be more informed. And therefore we can use um, artificial intelligence with feature selection to try to stream and scream and, you know, and, and differentiate what do we really need in certain situations and, uh, and then try to 
uh, infer and get to a personalized um, medicine and a personalized rehabilitation or cognitive rehabilitation plan. So I hope that in this talk, you, I could give you a panoramic of what of the power of MRI and the need for using this power, one with very, very good planning of what you need and uh, you know, of, the, of the techniques that are answering your research question or, re, or your clinical questions. And then um, what you need to do if you have, uh, um, you know, what are the challenges for the future and the need to bridge the gaps with other disciplines. And I'd like to thank my, my teams at NMR Research Unit in London and uh, the Neuroimaging Lab in Pavia and all the funders of my research. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you, Gloria. So uh, it was a very wonderful talk with a lot of information covered uh, and that invoke us with a lot of questions also. But looking into your schedule, uh, we would like to know if you can take up some questions. Yeah, I can, I can, I can. Sorry, I, it went a bit longer than I thought. <laughs> uh, audience, uh, the participants, if you have any questions, could you uh, post this in the chat so that I can read it out to her? So by the time the questions come up, uh, I wanted to ask you about the uh, the density between the gray matter and white matter. You said that, so uh, it is based on the density decides uh, the resonance, like uh, how much uh, uh, resonance happens there. So uh, in the gray area, it would be very high and, uh, oh, sorry, the other way around. The gray area, it would be very less and the white area, it would be very high. Uh, is that the case? Yes, but it's not just density. So it's also how the water is uh, uh, interacting with other um, water molecules. The proton density across the across the um, um, the tissue is fairly is fairly flat. And actually, because you're looking at protons, not necessarily density of axons. Actually, there is a little bit uh, more in in white matter, but it's quite a flat a flat uh, uh, map. But then if you take into account how the tissue reacts between them, um, you, you differentiate the contrast and you can have either the gray matter looking brighter than the white matter or the white matter looking brighter than the gray matter, depending on which type of response you're going to look at. So it's very complicated, but it, it doesn't depend only on the density of the tissue. It depends on how the microstructure affects because water exchanges, exchanges energy with the other water molecules, but also with other macromolecules. So this exchange of energy affects the MRI signal in a way. So it's not an easy, an easy answer, an easy concept. So there's lots playing going on. Yeah. So we have two questions. Uh, what can MRI tell us on the function of uh, very tiny axons? So that is one question. What, is Along, uh, yeah. what can MRI tell us on the functions of very tiny axons? Uh, that is yeah. one part. With yeah. uh, higher density and others, uh, how would you foresee AI-based pipeline methods for neurologists in the future? So these are two okay. questions by the, from the same okay. person. Okay, one, one question about the tiny axons. You can't, as I said, because you average across millimeter square, you can't differentiate populations. So unless you've got an hypothesis that a certain population response or a tiny axons are the one that are actually... So this is why I was saying you need to bridge gaps. So if you know from cellular physiology that a certain type of axons are responsible for a certain function, you could try to build your experiment to go and activate those tiny axons. And then if those are tiny axons are activated, you probably would get a signal change like in the big axons. But you could only know this from an hypothesis-driven experiment. The second, the second um, or for example, if you do like an EEG fMRI experiment where you've got the EEG that looks actually at 
direct uh, uh, electro, uh, the electrophysiology of the ac activity. And you know, for example, the band of the tiny axons compared to the one of, or the neurons compared to the thicker ones. So you need to, to have an hypothesis and go and find the answer for that. If you just look at the MRI signal, there is no way that you can distinguish. Regarding AI, I think it's the future for many reasons, because um, AI can help improving the image quality. So you could acquire a very, very rich data set and then, um, and then go and acquire something that is 10 times or even more times shorter in acquisition time and obtain the same quality. Or We've like done processing. Work, yeah, for, through the processing. Uh, all manufacturers uh, of MRI manufacturers are now embedding AI in their reconstructions of the data to improve how fast you can go and how good quality images you can go. AI, I'm sure that it will help going down to the high, finer resolutions. You can't go to the single axons, but you know you could acquire data at seven Tesla with a much higher like sub millimeter resolutions and go and then acquire data at three Tesla and then reconstruct it to the resolution of the high field. So I think that, that in 10 years times, we will, this talk would be very, will be very, very different than, than what it has been today because of AI. The next question is, why specifically a squeeze ball technique is employed for the study? Is it because it is uh, directly related to activities of daily life? Yes, exactly. So I wanted to do, I didn't want to go on a task on and off task. I wanted to see how graded the response was. And there are there were some uh, work showing that um, the bold response is slightly different at different frequency and an axon's frequency, firing frequency is linked to force application. And if you think of it, you will use different force to hold the glass or to hold like the mouse or to hold the headphones or something because of the different ways. So, and gripping is the most generic way. So that's why we decided to do that. And also it's less, it's less um, there's less effort if you think of patients then having to more relaxing, maybe. something maybe uh, fine or whatever, it's just something that is easy to, fairly easy to do. Uh, two more questions have come up. Uh, mm -hmm. Any work on resting state activity in psychiatric illness in uh, particular uh, psychosis? I think that, that there is a lot of work on resting state in psychiatric diseases. And, uh, and I'm not this sure. This is particularly uh, to your team. Uh, so right. we, don't, we haven't done any, no. I did a while ago, long ago, we did some, some work uh, in schizophrenia, but it was more on uh, a density on VBM, on, on thickness of cortical thickness and changes in, 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 in cortical morphology in schizophrenia compared to, to other uh, to healthy subjects. But, but I don't do actively um, psychi psychiatry applications. <laughs> Uh, another question. This question is regarding the best temporal resolution. Can it be half second or less of FM, fMRI task I can get? Uh, if I conduct a task which, uh, uh, which measures reaction time, cognitive task like measuring how quickly a participant makes a chess move, what is the lowest reaction time that I can attempt to correlate to specific brain regions? Is it half second or even lower? How low can it go? Uh, it would be a bit of a guess because um, it's not uh, something that I looked into um, recently. One thing that it, it depends as well from the acquisition point of view, you could have something that samples the data as fast as you want down to a couple of hundred of milliseconds. Um, for example, we done, we've done a study, I haven't published it yet, but we acquire some data on one slice positioned on the motor cortex and somebody doing a finger tapping and trying to see whether we could sample much higher frequencies than the usual three seconds of repetition time or two seconds of repetition time. And we could squeeze it down to, to 
around 200 milliseconds sampling of the data because I just selected one position of the brain. I didn't acquire the entire brain. So if you want to acquire the entire brain, you need, I think the best that I saw was around uh, between 500 milliseconds and a second of repetition between one acquisition and the second one. And I guess that your, your uh, reaction time depends on how quickly you can sample the data. Because you can, if, if your data sampling is every few hundred uh, milliseconds, you can't go and test reaction times of microseconds. Um, but then maybe I would need to look at the literature to be sure of this. So I think I will take up this last question. Okay. Uh, how do you see the scope of EEG informed transcranial brain uh, simulation protocols in MRI studies for patients with neurocognitive disorders? So you, the EEG fMRI um, combined um, yeah. uh, tra transcranial brain uh, simulation protocols. Okay. Um, I think that there are there is a big effort to try to to use uh, multiple different methodologies to try to impact on diseases and uh, um, and on brain functions. So um, I think that using, for example, um, you know, electrical recordings together with MRI would give you a much more, much more powerful way of understanding what's going on. Whether this will be done in everybody, it's it's very it's very difficult to say because it may not be the case, and maybe studies that actually can use um, can use this variety of uh, of applications. Some as well may potentially invasive might give us a hint of how to in, invest in uh, new technologies or in new ways of stimulating the brains or or on uh, achieving maybe um, an improvement without having to operate upon a subject or stick a, a, a needle inside the brain to stimulate a certain, a certain area. Um, and maybe the, the, the use of uh, TMS, for example, may be more and more uh, accurate if we know exactly where to go and stimulate the person from the outside areas of the brain. Okay. Uh, questions coming up again. Uh, <laughs> should I uh, continue with it or? Is it... I think I think maybe one one thing that we could do is that if if people have got questions, I don't mind uh, mm, answering it later. Uh, uh, asking, uh, yeah. Answering them via emails, and uh, if if people want, as long as I don't get hundreds of them. But, you know, if there are people that with burning questions, maybe I can I can as well point them to the right resources to, to find the answers if I don't have them on the tip of my fingers, eh? if you know what I mean. Okay. So, yeah. uh, uh, so I think uh, you are in a hurry for the next meeting. So yeah, I'm sorry. I just, I just, we just got this, this timing initially <laughs> um, misunderstood. So if, if you don't mind, I could, I would, uh, I would uh, like to propose these solutions that I, can take. I don't. I really don't mind getting emails. Um, I can, if you want, I can write my emails on the chat so that people. So as long as you don't email me all together, <laughs> I'll be happy to, to reply and to answer. Okay. Right. Uh, okay. It was very good the presentation. Very lot of information. Very a lot of questions. Uh, everything you. was very like a lot of information. So okay. Once again, we thank you uh, thank for you. your session. And thank you very much. And I hope to come to Amrita soon. Yeah. Okay. We look forward to that. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Claudia. Bye. Bye, thank Sham. Bye. Thank you so much, Dr. Asha, for uh, chairing the session in such a well-ordered manner. And thank you, Professor Claudia, for adding into our knowledge about the relevance of quantitative MRI, the breakthroughs that it is important to create, uh, along with AI in the fields of clinical diagnosis and how it would be useful in suggesting personalized medicines in near future. Thank you so much once again for uh, giving us such a wonderful section. Thank you.
拜，拜拜。